This is Untether.tv, where we get inside the business of mobile. Here's your host, Rob Woodbridge. Hi, everybody. Rob Woodbridge from Untether.tv, where we get inside the business of mobile. I'm joined today by two guys, the co-founders of Inedible Software. It's uh, Eddie Marks and uh, James, it's James Anthony, right? So, Ed, Eddie, James, yeah. Welcome, guys. Thanks for sharing your story on Untether.tv. Appreciate you being yeah. here. Our pleasure. So give us the uh, give us the elevator pitch about uh, what uh, uh, Inedible does, and then we're going to move into what you guys how you how you guys got here. Okay, uh, so Inedible software is sort of um, the catch all for everything that we like to do on the iPhone. Um, so the main focus of it is uh, iPhone applications, mostly for consumers. But we've occasionally dabbled. We do some teaching, um, some consulting. We do um, we did some contract work for a while, but I've sort of stopped doing that. Uh, that now. So for the most part, though, it's just sort of toys and games and fun things for people. So, on the app. so teaching, like uh, you yeah. guys taught application development, or was it? Uh, was... Yeah. yeah. So we taught uh, two boot camps, or um, yeah, so the iPhone boot camp was the header. It's run by a guy uh, from New York, and so he he wrote to us, and we ended up um, planning out and then teaching uh, two of these. It's a three-day course, eight hours a day, sort of trying to get you off the ground. And so we wrote all of our own slides and all of our own projects and stuff. And so we taught two of those. And, and that's pretty cool. Is it? But is it? Is it really focused on, on, on developing applications, or is it about the whole gamut of marketing and, and creating awareness, or is it just on development? It's mostly just for development. So the last day we sort of dabble on what iPhone is like in the real world. <laughs> um, yeah. Drastically uh, different. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Sort of all the lessons. Um, that yeah, that you need to know if you were actually going to put out an application. But the class itself is focused on sort of the technical details of actually writing applications. Yeah. And then on the monetization side, I actually gave a guest lecture at the uh, Stanford iPhone class on monetization and kind of real world app stuff, and that's available on iTunes U. Really? So Stanford, uh, we're totally off topic already. We're seven seventeen <laughs> seconds into this, and yeah. so Stanford has a a, a monetizing iPhone. They have an Stanford iPhone class? Has a phone development class, which really? is actually yeah. we got to start. Okay. Um, and they've had a few iterations of it, and they thought no, this year it would be fun to pull in one of the old alumni from the class and to uh, kind of get an idea of what the real world is like, you know, having someone who took the class and then went on to do professional iPhone development. And so, you know, I gave a quick spiel on, you know, how to actually make some money off of it and <laughs> pitfalls to watch out for, all the mistakes we made, kind of what you would expect. We're going to come back to that uh, because I'm I'm really intrigued by by this. Was the class full? Yeah, uh, the class that um that when we took it, there were 140 applicants for 50 spots, I think. Wow. Um, and for whatever reason, they decided we were worthy. And, <laughs> That's great. And, uh, to pull in, well, but uh, I, I mean, I'm I'm uh, I want to get this is maybe a little bit of, of your history as well, and we'll get into this, um, but uh, when you applied for this class, was it the first year running? Yeah, this was the first time they did it. The, um, the iPhone stuff was actually still under NDA, which made everything really interesting. No one really knew the legality of it because teaching iPhone development was kind of, you know, a sketchy thing at the time. So I think we were all technically members of one big university development team that happened to have two leaders that worked at Apple and were engineers. Um, but yeah, it was a terrific experience. And, you know, the iPhone was still, you know, so new. So there was a very small number of people that were working on it with Apple. And we had two of them. So, you know, we would literally ask a question and, you know, they would look at each other and say, did you write that part or did I? And, <laughs> that's so, so great, isn't it? They got it from the horse's mouth. Yeah. Or a uh, good idea. Thanks. Like, is there, can you guys take credit for any of the uh, stuff that went into the, uh, into this? Any um, good there questions? Were a couple funny moments. Like we wanted some um, more music library integration that ended up coming in 3.0. And we would, you know, someone would say from the Apple team, you know, why don't you just tie into the music library? And we're like, you don't let us do that. <laughs> they were like, really? That's still not exposed? Like, we'll get back on that. Yeah, so they yeah. jump back and it's done the next day, right? Just in, <laughs> in typical coding fashion. Well, so uh, talk about the lessons that you then went back and imparted. Um, sorry, Eddie, I, I, I'm really intrigued by this. Is that what, what? Give me a summary of what the lessons you imparted about iPhone development in the real world and making money to this class. Yeah, I mean, I guess the, the key thing right there is it is making money and it is a business and you know it has all the pitfalls of real world business practices and you know it's really a cover your ass kind of situation you know there's there's money at stake there's you know i don't want to say lives at stake but there's you know <laughs> my health insurance at stake which is kind of related so um 
you know, really making sure you put in the safeguards you need, knowing how to handle with the iPhone development process. If you need to put out an update, that can be a matter of weeks. So making sure you have enough server side controls and kill switches and just making sure you're nimble enough to, to survive everything that is inevitably going to go wrong. Yeah, and uh, you know the gate is, <clears throat> is is one that you've got to you know go through anyways, and uh, it's good to know. Well, I, I mean, as, as you think of things that you you uh, you imparted on this, your words of wisdom to this class, interject. Doesn't matter what we're talking about, just throw them out. <laughs> it can well, be it can be like a Rain Man experiment here, where you just top of mind whatever comes into your head, just let me know what it is, because uh, I'm intrigued. Right? Uh, what do you think? What's the enrollment? Still, uh, uh, you know, a class of fifty uh, with that program. At Stanford? Uh, I think they've kept it around that. Yeah. Um, the teachers have rotated a bit. Um, they still have Apple guys in there for the most part. Yeah. Uh, it's been popular. You know, I keep I go back to Stanford campus now and then, and I still see that it definitely has interest, and people still know about it. So I think the program's done really well for them. And it's still all on iTunes U, which is great. Yeah, when people good. ask, you know, how to get a good start in iPhone development, you know, I'll point them to iTunes U right away. Well, is it, um, what kind of questions were you getting? Um, the questions were interesting. It was all over the map. The one question that was kind of the hardest for me to answer was, so what if I don't want to be doing all this business stuff? I just want to write apps. And it's one of those like dead obvious questions. And, yeah. you know, it's, you know, find a partner. You're at Stanford. There's probably <laughs> someone who's happy to do that for you. Just around um, the corner somewhere, I'm sure. Yeah. 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 Some companies are coming up that are willing to take more of like a publisher type role. But, you know, for the most part, I think it's, you know, accepting that if you want to get an app out there, you have to. Because we've, we've dealt with a lot of people who will make a really cool app and, you know, they'll bemoan the fact that it never went anywhere, never saw the visibility, and we'll say, like, well, okay, like, how do you market it? What blogs did you talk to? You know, where's your YouTube video, your Facebook fan page? You know, what's going on? And they said, oh, no, like, I just put it on the store and then it didn't go anywhere. Why would I sink more time into it? It's like, you know, I play. it's worth the thing. <laughs> Well, no. I, I mean, uh, we'll do a later on in the show in, in this conversation. We'll talk about uh, how you guys uh, marketed your first product, and, and uh, really interested in the lessons there. But let's let's talk about. So you you obviously Stanford grads, uh, and then uh, went through this program, um, and then did you before you took the program? Did you think, hey, let's do this? I mean, the iPhone wasn't even out at that point. Yeah. Well, we so we heard about it in the summer before, sort of like the vague rumblings of of Stanford trying to put together this class, yeah. um, which as James said, the, the NDA was still in place. So everyone was like, how is it going to be possible? And so we sort of, I was like, James, like, let's do it. Let's go for it. Um, it seemed like the plan wasn't to start a company uh, and it was full time. It was more like we saw that there was a good opportunity and, and just decided to try to pursue it. So we sort of tried to fight our way into the class and tried to write our applications to look, you know, good. And, and they took us. And they took uh, you. <laughs> yeah. It's like an audition. What were you in? Uh, what were you going to school for? What was your uh, What was your focus? Uh, so I did a double major in math and economics, and James did physics. So, like, no, no software developer in any of you. Yeah. So I ended up getting a minor in computer science, okay. kind of after the fact. Yeah. I had a, a couple classes under the belt, and you know, figured as long as I'm going to do this full time, I might as well get some stamp on it. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, no. I mean, it's been interesting coming at it from a different perspective, but. You know, we we've never really considered ourselves software engineers per se. Yeah. Well, from the blog post, we'll talk about it a little while. Uh, uh, you know that you know Eddie, that's an economics, uh, that's a, an economist yeah. approach, right? Uh, very much an economist approach to uh, to do that. Um, so you you go into the program, you're inspired by what goes through the program. You have direct access to two of the chief architects in this uh, great platform, um, and then you graduate. What what year was that? Uh, 2009. 2009. Actually, so just last year. So what's interesting is that we didn't, um, we actually started the company before we graduated. Yeah. So um, so we took our final project and we, so we had it in the fall quarter, which is right when the year starts. And so right after that is winter break and it's a month. Yeah. And so some of the guys in the class were like, hey, what we should do is all sort of work on our apps over break and then we'll all release them at the same time. Um, so we'll all submit them January 1st. And then we'll release them all January 15th, say, and then we'll try to get some press, essentially. So one of the guys started StanfordiPhoneApps.com. Yep. Um, and so we, um, so we spent our entire winter break sort of shining up Air Guitar, polishing it, working on it. Um, so I was actually in Hawaii at the time, but I was like on the couch, like <laughs> talking That's to James. That's so, a bad place um, to do it in. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so we went back and forth. And then, yeah, so that hit the store, I think, January 15th. Um, along with a couple of others. Actually, we were surprised not that many people 
put their apps in the store. So 50 people took the class. Probably some people worked in teams of two like us, but probably 45 apps. Um, only, I think, eight or ten have ever made it on the store. And only like four or five were on on the date that we all set. And and uh, have any of them kind of achieved the, the returns or the you know the press or attention that you guys have? Are there any other ones in there? Not that many of them. One of them got some good press called Ching Wen, which is like a Chinese character. Um, it, it, it's like an auto completion of Chinese words. Yeah. So you type. So you start to write in the first character and it suggests all the other characters okay. that come off of it. Um, but most of the yeah most of the apps. A lot of people took the class more from academic interest not really seeing it as like a good market to her to go into and so they didn't even bother to put their final projects on the store. Well, how did you guys come up with the idea for Air Guitar? Um, we, we, it was actually one of our later ideas uh, oh, yeah. with, with a couple of others, but they were like, the teachers were like, hey, use something about the iPhone that's cool, something that's new. Yeah. And so we looked at it and there's location, there's the internet that's sort of always there, um, and there's the accelerometer. And so we looked at the store and even now, Shake and Tilt is just about all anyone's done yeah. with the accelerometer. Yeah. Um, and, and at the time, there was basically nothing else. And so we're, we're like, we bet we can do better than that. And James came from physics background, so he was like, you know, this thing gives you actual readings, yeah. um, so why can't we use them? So you, you invented the whammy bar for the, for the yeah. iPhone, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it was actually, it, we were talking about it, about strumming. We're like, oh, that's cool. And then James was like, well, you could whammy it when you yeah. tilt. And we were like, soul, like, yeah. that's it. That's the project. It's the best thing ever. It's the best thing yeah. ever, right? But it, uh, you know, you uh, it, it seems logical when you see it. it. Seems logical and intuitive when you play it. And, you know, anybody who's played Guitar Hero, you know, there's there's you know different motions that allow you to do all these things. But but uh, nobody's done it, right? So was that surprising to you guys at at that point where you're thinking like nobody's really looked at it this way? Yeah, I mean, for us, it was. So the accelerometer, the touch screen too, like when the iPhone came out, it had one of the most, you know, brilliant screens you could have. So you really just want, you know, something that you can lick off the screen basically. <laughs> um, but what was cool to us was that, you know, with the iPhone, with all of the, the sensors that it has and with the great screen it has, it's really this kind of transformative object. Yeah. Um, so the idea with, with Air Guitar is, you know, you're not making an app that's running in a window anymore. You're making a tactile thing. You're turning your phone into something. Yep. Um, and the Guitar Hero resemblance definitely isn't a mistake. You know, this was a, a product for the masses kind of thing. We wanted people to be able to to create at least some level of music. You know, pretty easily get up and running um, and play something that sounded cool. So the idea was, you know, how do you put something in their hands that they can use as an instrument? You know, definitely evoke guitar, but while you know clearly not being anywhere near like a pocket guitar or something, which was a very cool app. Um, a lot as a tech demo, but if you try to play it, try to play chords, it never really, really did its thing. So we tried to figure out how to simplify it as much as we could. Well, uh, so when you, um, what was the first app that you guys came out with? Was it, was it the Shotgun? It was Air Guitar. It was Air Guitar. It was Air Guitar. Okay. And uh, and how how was the response for that? Like um, you you launched it January fifteenth or mid January oh nine, so yeah. a year and a half ago. Um, what was the response? So. So it was the 3G, not the 3GS at that point. It was slower processor. But what was the response at, around then? Yeah, put it, it, it was good. Um, it wasn't, we were trying to do like for, the idea was to make the Ocarina of Rock music. Um, and it never really turned into Ocarina of Rock. Yeah. Um, so, uh, yeah, it's definitely been, yeah. it, it's definitely a success. It peaked at number eight in music, I think. Um, and it's gotten, I forgot, I don't know, off the top of my head, 35,000 downloads or something. Yeah. Um, so it's certainly, it's gotten, yeah, I would call it successful, but it wasn't like a wild success. Yeah. And, yeah. and it was actually sort of the, the slight disappointment from that that prompted us to like, you know, write a shotgun app because <laughs> uh, we tried to change the world and bring people music. Um, Let's do something that's just like fun. Yeah. And, uh, do something to show our, our frustration without really venting, right? Is that yeah. Uh, well, I, I interviewed uh, for this. It isn't. It hasn't been published on the day that we're doing this. Uh, you know, Guy Wang from uh, yeah. Sonic Mule, and uh, you know, he talked about democratizing music, right? Bringing music to the lowest common denominator. I mean, I played guitar, real guitar, for twenty years, and I still suck, right? <laughs> and that, that's the thing about embracing an instrument. Um, so, uh, you know, how much of that went into it? Uh, you wanted to kind of say, listen, you could, 
Yeah, Guitar Hero was is was a massive game, and uh, it taught people to play guitar. Um, but did that go into it, or were you just thinking this would be the coolest app? Um, it's definitely a music thing. So I play bass, Eddie plays drums. You know, we both come from somewhat musical backgrounds. Yeah. Um, I think music is something that you know, quite honestly, most people like to do. Um, <laughs> the iPhone, you know, also came kind of evolved in a way out of the iPod background. So, you know, music was always a core functionality of the iPhone. Yep. Um, so we always designed air guitar from the ground up to be able to play with your music. Um, you know, it has a fairly limited range in terms of the actual music you can compose and play as a solo instrument, yep. but it kind of shines when you're using it to interact with your own music. So for me, you know, I'm, I'm from New York, I'd be waiting for a subway, you know, probably asking to get mugged, shaking my iPod up and down. <laughs> listening to my music but it was worth it and uh i got away safely <laughs> it was fine and uh, same thing same thing with you eddie was it uh is music influenced you uh, obviously drums yeah yeah so the reason the, the very first version so the current version of air guitar has two modes is a basic mode and advanced mode um the very first version only had the basic mode and the basic mode we pick chords that sound good together. Yep. So the idea was we wanted from the start to be no knowledge of music whatsoever. And we find the people who have the hardest time using a guitar are those who know real guitar. Yeah. They expect it to play real guitar, but it's just like you get someone who plays real guitar and Guitar Hero, it doesn't work out either. They're no better at Guitar Hero than anyone else. And a little kid who's like, who's like 12 is like going away. It's like just drawing. A thousand notes a minute, right? Yeah. yeah, exactly. So yeah, so that was the idea was to sort of not require you to know sort of anything about music. Yeah, it's, it's, it's like you said, um, start to democratize it. Yeah, so anyone can sort of, we wanted to give you all the joy of rocking out with none of the skill required to play an actual instrument. So good. Well, I, um, <clears throat> as I said, I've been playing guitar for 20 years and I'm terrible. And, and uh, I used to sit on my, this is an aside, just to show how pathetic it is that uh, <laughs> I think maybe there's a there's a an instrument for me somewhere, but it certainly isn't the guitar. I, I used to sit in front of my uh, my front step of my house and uh, and play the guitar out front. And and uh, a woman walked by, very patiently waited until I was finished my song, and she walked up to me and put a you know a, a Canadian toonie, which is a two dollar coin, in front of me and asked me to stop playing. Oh. <laughs> so I, I I I'm ecstatic when I see something like uh, Sonic Mule's you know Glee app that is supposed to allow me to sing properly and and play guitar with uh, you know with their guitar. But it still doesn't help, man. So uh, <laughs> they haven't really created the the Rob app for uh, mu the musically challenged, right? Uh, yeah. We'll get there, I'm sure. Um, that was just an aside, yeah. yeah. So uh, when you uh, so then you built then you went into the shotgun mode, right? So you went something creating something beautiful to you know musical uh, to something like chick, chick, <laughs> right? Yeah. So, and and that was the first time that I was exposed to you guys. So the air guitar didn't reach me until somebody walked over to me and, and did that with the uh, with the shotgun. Um, I, there was a reaction from that one, obviously. Um, yes. How, yes. How, how how did that go over? So it was basically the very first day we put it out. Someone from IGN found it and wrote a really really nice review about it, and he really got us. So we like zombie movies. Yeah. And he wrote it without any prompting. There's no zombies in the description. He wrote about running around his apartment shooting imaginary zombies. Um, and we were like, this is awesome. And so um, I guess from that, we did, I think, uh, 1,500 downloads in the first day. And then it started going viral. 3,000, 6, 9, 15, 25, 30. Um, a couple of days later, it was doing 150,000 downloads in a oh, day. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So it peaked at number two on the store about like 10 days later. Um, yeah, and so we were only stopped for number one. Uh, so tap Tap Revenge 2 launched the exact same time that we did. So darn you, Tap Tap. But um, but yeah, so it sort of blew up. And then, yeah, that, that's when we started to consider. Um, yeah, well, so, so actually, at first, there were no third-party ads in it whatsoever. It was yeah. only promoting our other apps. Yep. So Shotgun Pro came out. It peaked at number nine. Uh, we had ads for Air Guitar. Um, and it was only a several months later that we decided to to put third party ads in there. Like, are you um, using AdMob or uh, what do you? Yeah, well, it's yeah. <laughs> that, Keeping that's... ads fresh and relevant is basically um, one of the most important things that we do. So we have seven advertisers, um, including I will not AdMob anymore. Yeah. Um, but in our in our app that we sort of route between. But we started with AdMob um, right away because they seemed like a logical choice. But we always had it built in with other options. And so right away we started to tweak all those knobs. 
And that's some of the stuff that James is talking about for the iPhone class is sticking in ad mediation, sticking in ad world, or sticking in Bursley or TapJoy to kind of allow you to, to twist those twist those knobs. Well, and so, and again, I'm going to come back to, to the revenue yeah, generation piece, but, but um, when, when you put out, uh, when you put out the shotgun app, um, how, what, how many downloads ha- like combined? So pro and, and, uh, and the light version, how, how many downloads have you had? Um, I think shotgun free has a hundred, uh, sorry, uh, six and a half million. Uh, shotgun pro has got uh, probably close to 200,000. That's incredible. At this point. Like, uh, did you ever think as, uh, you know, as non-software developers to begin with, or non-software engineers, that you could reach out and, you know, touch that many people with an application, something that you've created? No. No, it was, it's, it's mind-boggling. Yeah, it's really insane. The yeah. numbers were, you know... It's something like, yeah, it was on like 5% of all iPhones and iPod touches. Had, had, had this on it. Yeah. 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 So it's sort of like when we go out somewhere and meet someone, they're like, so what have you done? And I want to talk about air guitar, but I'm like, have you heard of shotgun? <laughs> yeah, exactly. And they're like, yes. Yeah, and our friends, you know, it starts to drive them crazy because some, you know, friend of a friend will show them like, hey, have you seen the shotgun app on the iPhone? And they're like, oh God, I know <laughs> that. <alone>. Guy. <laughs> well, what was the uh, what was the impact uh, on that on air guitar? Like, did you guys see some? So you advertised uh, the air guitar in, yeah. in in the shotgun app. Did you see an uptick? Did did that have an it's- impact? Huge spike, yeah, a huge spike. Yeah, so before that, I think we'd the highest rank we got in music was probably in the fifties or forties. And as I said, as soon as Shotgun came out, it spiked up to number I think eight. Yeah, um, w- w- was where it peaked. So, so you've got uh, and when did you release the Shotgun app? That was like, middle of '09, kind of thing. Uh, um, it was like February, actually. It was about a month after Air Guitar. Okay. Right. Um, yeah, that was our our burnout on Air Guitar. What do we do next? You know, we were still in the accelerometer mindset, you know, this whole idea of the transformative phone, you know, what are what are these iconic gestures that everyone knows how to do? Yeah. And, and cocking and firing a shotgun happens to be one of those. Um, yeah. And so um, Eddie came up with the idea, or, or I came up with the idea, Eddie took it seriously. Yeah, James was, was, his first mistake. <laughs> James was joking. I was like, that's genius. He's like, no, it's not. Yeah. I'm like, I'm going to go start. And so I like started, and he's like, he's like I'm not going to help you. Yeah. I'm like, come on. He's like, okay, fine. I will. You will. The- for like two weeks he would come in with some accelerometer code and I would like throw it back and forth it wouldn't work I'd just hand it back to him and go about whatever I was doing and then he finally convinced me to kind of whip up some artwork you know put the ads in place do some nuts and bolts stuff and then you know to us it was always a fun thing you know can't hurt to put it out in the store it'll be fun to have around the dorm and you know a lot of other people in dorms thought the same thing so well you know I I, I don't know if you guys I mean the criticism against the iPhone as a platform, uh, so you know, in the enterprise or business case sense, is that uh, while well, all all they have are are fart apps and shotgun apps, like uh, that's <laughs> what you kept on hearing, right? Is that you know that that was it? But uh, you know, little did they know, right? The impact of of a shotgun app uh, could do that. When you yeah. It launches, it's an it launches enterprise the, shotgun, by the way. It's an enterprise. <laughs> that's right. It saves lives, quite <laughs> frankly. We, we have, you know, official email confirmation. There's some people probably higher up in their companies than they should be that, you know, <laughs> shoot down bad ideas with yeah, a shotgun. From the border. Well, I wonder how many lives it's saved, right? Uh, we'll just, uh... <clears throat> so, uh... Not as many marriages as it's destroyed. <laughs> no, that's true. That's right. Well, iPhones, eh? Mm-hmm. Uh, when you built this thing, uh, did you have... Uh, both of these apps. Did you did you have a pricing idea in 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 mind? Did you know what you were going to price it? Did you know that you're doing the shotguns? You're going to incorporate ads. Like, did you have that thought out before you uh, you built these apps? Uh, not not really. So we knew we wanted to make air guitar pay um, because there wasn't a good we can, we still haven't come up with a good free version of it. Um, but we were seeing about this time, sort of looking at the market, the freemium was starting to establish itself. Mm-hmm as like the dominant way to market applications. And so um, for Shotgun, we actually, we wrote it as free first. Yeah. And, um, and then sort of most of the way through it, we were like, well, you know, looking at the market, yeah, we shouldn't just promote, just send ads to Air Guitar. Like, why don't we make a pay version of it as well? And so we added in some more guns um, and we took off the ads. 
Yeah, and people were writing in after the. We didn't really take the free one seriously at first launch. We had no idea you know, it was going to get anywhere near the traction. Well, I think I think Eddie took it seriously. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, I mean, the point being, it was a free version. It had ads to our own apps. We didn't think we were going to get nearly that volume where third-party advertising was going to start to be lucrative. And we were getting emails in from customers saying, you know, can I give you a dollar? Like, you know, why isn't there a paid version? I want to get rid of the ads. I want more guns. Like, you know, what's next? And you know, first rule of business is probably don't leave money on the table. So yeah, so you yeah, accept, it was, you accept a dollar, right? Yeah, yeah. It, it was quite surprising to us. Yeah, more than once we had folks just write in, like, "Where can I? Like, I want to buy something from you. What can I buy from you?" Yeah, um, I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Shotgun Pro, Air Guitar. Yeah, uh, Song Stiff, go for it. Well, so uh, after that, after the success of that, uh, how long did you uh, sit back and enjoy that for? Um, we didn't come out well, so yeah, so I guess this goes into the long list of lessons that we've, we've learned. Um, our next application, uh, we did after that before the school year ended was actually for a movie. Um, we did it, uh, for a movie called Mutant Chronicles. Yep. Uh, the app actually, uh, quite sadly to us, we worked incredibly hard on it. Um, and it's actually kind of, uh, quite nice, I think, but it sat in the Apple review process for three months. And the movie went into theaters and out of theaters with no email whatsoever, no notification, and then it was unceremoniously approved um, well, well too late. Um, so this was sort of when we started to get some popularity from Shotgun. We're like, well, now we can do... The idea was to do... It seemed like sexy and cool to do apps for, like, real companies, real projects. You know, yeah, yeah it seemed more, like, to verify or, yeah, to, to validate us um, as developers. And so we sort of started walking down that path, and obviously the first foray into it um, was incredibly disappointing. So um, you, that was, uh, you, you got paid to do that? That was a, a contract gig? Well, yeah, so the idea was we were trying to break into the Hollywood scene, and so we wanted to do the first one on spec with the promise of future apps. And so it was like, if you can show us what you can do for us, um, then we'll give you an app for all of our future movies. Yeah. Um, when they were like, well, what did they do for us? Uh, turned out nothing. <laughs> Because uh, the app never came out, um, so the um, wow, the that's, that's were, hard. Yeah, it was uh, it was rough, but that was also a learning experience. Like you know, we're still college seniors at this point. Um, were I to do it again, I probably would have definitely asked for some money up front, um, because you know we ended up bearing all the risk yep. from from it yeah. and seeing none of the reward. Yeah, and another problem that comes into that with contracting is even when the money comes later, we've had had problems a few times where. If your client doesn't have skin in the game, if it's some straight rev share where they haven't put any money down and they're not doing the work, um, it's easy for them to, you know, it's not even quite slacking off, but everything tends to take longer. It doesn't feel as serious in their minds, and it's tough to get the resources you need. Well, yeah, you get what you pay for, and uh, and I always say that if if you, uh, it's the same with the pricing of the application, but if you um, if you cause a little pain, so you have to put a little dollar value in what you're doing. Um, you will get the response that you need because there's an in, there's a there's a debt owing right, um, or they've already put money into this so that they can actually uh, you they're compelled to work with you and work on your deadlines. Um, yeah. And I see so many times people doing that on spec uh, or even a rev share, um, and uh, it's usually the complicated things uh, that take a long time to build that uh, that come into that because it's a high risk for everybody. Um, and uh, do you know of any movie games that have worked? Well, so um, Warner Brothers, I think, puts out an app for every one of their movies now. Uh, so Avatar yeah. and Iron Man 2 have games from Gameloft. Yep. Um, Terminator had, uh, the latest Terminator had an app for it that you could, like, sort of terminate me. You yeah. could make yourself Terminator-ish. Um, 2012 had some 2012 trivia had a trivia app. And those were all... Um, they were all pretty successful. They were all also Apple sponsored, yeah. Um, so Apple sort of stamped them with their featured app. Yeah, and put them up um, on the front page of iTunes, and yeah, yeah. yeah so um, they had mixed reviews. Um, some had very good reviews. Some had pretty bad reviews. But um, one of our original ideas, sort of for an edible, was to try to be the go-to guys for Hollywood um, applications, and it never really uh, worked out that way. Stalled uh, on game that. one. But, so now. So when you when you went through that process and and uh, then you you decided to move away from the Hollywood scene, yeah, um, yeah, we 
Yeah, so we ended up doing some more contract work for sort of other startups and stuff after that. Uh, I think this is even still before we came out with our next in-house application. Um, and we had a couple of more. So we did a promotion for Ubisoft. Um, we did a mapping application um, for a company called Micello. Yep. And um, all of those, they were, they were fine experiences. Um, we definitely got more money than zero out of them. Um, but it just wasn't, it wasn't really where we wanted to go. It was also that we realized that if we really wanted to do this seriously, we needed to start like a back office overseas to keep costs down um, or start to hire up a bunch of people on the cheap. And it becomes like this weird sort of um, trying to capture like the, the bit between your workers and the price and dealing with the, and so it was sort of not, not really what we wanted to get um, into. We realized we just weren't having any fun. Yeah. Um, and, and we also realized that most people, I was talking to people, and they were like, usually what you do is contract work first <laughs> to fund yourself to do your own stuff. And we went the exact opposite. Like, we had the funds from our own stuff that was coasting us over to allow us to do contract work. <laughs> it's crazy, isn't it? It's crazy, <laughs> crazy. So we're like, well, I mean, Nick's this. And, um, and so at some point we're like, okay, that's it. No more, no more. And so we're, and right now, for the past couple months, we've been doing exclusively our own applications um, I put out another five, three, I don't know, some number um, thereabouts, and are certainly having a lot more fun. Yeah, at creatively. It. So, what are the, some of the? So, you've got uh, Pow, right, which is out now. Yes. Oh yeah, yeah. So Pow came out. Um, that was right about the. That was right at the end of. That was right at the start of summer. Yeah. Okay. So that was sort of um, in the middle of the contract work. I forgot about Pow. Yeah. So okay. Pow, um, and then we did an app called Song Sift. Um, it's just actually useful. Uh, it helps you find music in your music library. Yep. Uh, and then One Hit Wonders, which is the opposite of song set that helps you find one-off random songs um, in that you've music, In your library. Library, yeah. Yeah. And is it? Uh, and how have those gone? Um, Pow has done pretty well. Um, we're actually we're working. We're very close to launching a big update to Pow, sticking in achievements and more social stuff. Um, like and just make you, you can actually punch fun. people. Is that? Uh... <laughs> no, um, you can do that now. We yeah. just have a disclaimer for it. <laughs> right. Break your phone and potentially your hand. Um, yeah, uh, Song Sift has done has done fine. It got actually a lot of really good blog coverage. Uh, from Gizmodo covered it. Um, there was another one. Um, uh, Macworld. Macworld. Yeah, financially it hasn't been a fantastic success. But um, but it's an app that we both use every day. So every that's single day, a success yeah. in my book. So just, yeah. Know, a need that at least we wanted filled. The people who want it kind of thank us profusely. So it's a community service deed, if nothing else. Uh, that's right. You should have charged ten bucks for it then. <laughs> what about uh, so I, iPad applications? Uh, yes, we did Bazooka. Bazooka, yeah. Yeah, for the iPad, and that, and that was actually mostly um, people at events all the time ask us. So what about iPad? So what about Android? So what about WebOS? And we sort of got a little tired of the. So what about iPad? So now we have an answer. <laughs> yeah, it's bazooka. bazooka. Yeah, that was a fun kind of weekend coding challenge. Can we knock this thing out in a day, maybe two? Um, and so, you know, it was just a fun project to do. I get a kick out of it. You know, not the plan to, to fund the next year of Inedible or anything, but yeah. it's nice to get that stuff out there. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a... That's uh, it's a you need an iPad, it's okay. <laughs> well, I mean, are you going to bring the other ones over there? I mean, shotgun. How many people are going to break their iPads because they're doing the shotgun? Yeah, part? it's it's hard. So, example, like for air guitar. Yeah. Um, if you have it the small mode, your fingers can't reach, and have it in the large mode, your hand isn't big enough. <laughs> um, so, like, they're really made for the iPhone. So. Yeah. Yeah, there's really no benefit to launching them up. <laughs> no, um, exactly. Yeah, we, we figured you know if you're going to go big, like go big. Um, if you're going to go small, like go small. Well, so uh, what? What's um, obviously inspired by uh, movement, right? Uh, and the ability to leverage the the, the technology in the iPhone. What, what? What? Where do you guys want to take this beyond uh, beyond this? Or do you just want to build these apps out? Um, you you're comfortable uh, working as partners in this in this vein? Yeah. So um, right now we're working uh, on what we think of like as the magnum opus of our apps. So we're actually making um, a a shotgun duel, and we're seeking a multiplayer um, on the ground up, so you and your friend can play with each other. Yeah. And so, and so that's sort of where we want to, um, like, it's already, so we got reports of kids on the playground um, sort of running around 
with their shotguns. Um, yeah, so we figured we'd give love them that. More, yeah, <laughs> yeah um, just a more kind of like structured way. And there's also, there isn't, there isn't a great multiplayer iPhone experience, I think, that's really out there yet. Um, there's some really cool things, like you can play Scrabble, um, with someone in the room, so there's stuff that's online, you know, so it's first person shooters, and there's all like the social games, like Mafia Wars, so like that. But there's no real like you and your friends squaring off with each other right here, right now. Yep. Um, that's really captured, and so that's sort of we're going for that um, a bit. And so after that, um, our plans. Uh, it's actually we've um, so we haven't just been doing uh, shotgun applications in the past year. We've worked on like a whole. Um, random variety of things. Like, for example, I spent a while trying to compile some of the iTunes data um, for our blog, yep. sort of about download numbers and artist stuff. But that's just, and so we've, um, and also since we've been focused on monetization uh, for so long that we spend as I said, a, a pretty significant chunk of our time uh, for ad optimization, advertiser relations. And so we've developed a number of like tools that help us. And sort of uh, for ad world, got started that way. Um, Sam and Ra wrote it for themselves for their own applications and then turned it into a company. Same with Tapjoy. Um, ben and Lee wrote it for themselves, turned it into a company. And so we've got what we think are potentially some cool tools hmm. um, that might sort of allow us to sort of step up to the platform level. It's more scalable. Yeah. Um, yeah. And also allows us to avoid, right now, the iPhone space is becoming more and more sort of professionalized where you're either a studio or a publisher. And um, so in the Xbox, this is like long ago established where the indies that try to be both um, have a really, really tough time. And so we could either push ourselves as a studio and hire artists and engineers, or push ourselves as a publisher and hire marketing and PR. And it's sort of like, what's really fun about our space right now is that we get to do it all. Yeah. Like we do all our own marketing, all our own PR, our own UI design, artwork, engineering, um, ad optimization. Um, and some of that we like more than others, but it's, you know, at the very least, we're getting our feet wet all over the place, and um, how much longer we, we can keep this up, you know, probably another year, um, but we figure we might want to just sort of um, quit while we're ahead. <laughs> like, it's better, what is it, it's better to burn out than it is to rust? Is that, uh, yeah. Yeah. so, I mean, it's interesting because, uh, you know, do you think that um, indie developers can, can, make a, a living can build a company or build a business out of developing for mobile uh, and not just the iPhone but you know Blackberry Android Windows mobile whatever it is like do you think that do you think that uh, that's something that they can do or is it just such high churn like you yeah so I think definitely they can but I think um, there's different kinds of applications and we've sort of always gone on the fun um, not a lot of yeah, it's like more like a game, right? Yep. So on the Xbox, for instance, if you're a studio, you're churning out hits. And that's very hard, I think, for an indie to keep making a bunch of sort of one-off applications. Yeah. What is definitely very viable is making like a monolithic app like Shazam or iTeleport that your company is behind and you work on it. And for ourselves, um, what we have right now that is that is Shotgun, like, but we don't want to be a company that, that is like centered around making the, the world's best shotgun, like that's not sort of um, what we want ourselves to be. Yep. Uh, and so if we had made Shazam, say, I could see sticking on with Shazam. Um, but yeah, I feel like if you're gonna, if you're gonna be an indie, you know, you should do a, like a Tweety yeah. or something like that, or a Beehive, um, where it's like one really good application that you can make the best that no one making one-off apps can touch you. Yeah, and and you think that that's something that, uh, and then you, I mean, you position yourself well, a la Tweety, for you know when you when you serve a need and you're the best in the market for a takeout or an acquisition, right? Yeah, exactly. Um, but I mean, I see. I, I've I've uh, spoken with a lot of guys who a lot of companies who are building five, six, seven, twenty applications and trying to make a living on on uh, you know the long tail. You think yeah. So stuff in the long tail, if you can quickly reskin them, so idea of, yeah, so if you're doing like fitness applications and can sort of plug in different videos yeah. uh, or book applications, you can plug in different content, um, that, that's, that's good. And we've been able to reuse some of our code from Pow to Shock and it's all accelerometer stuff yeah. um, at the end of the day. Um, but yeah, so we figured if you wanted to keep making gun apps, then we could sort of start to crank out a bunch of gun applications. Yeah. Um, but yeah, there's certainly a model there. But making... 
sort of the the overlap of song sift and shotgun yeah. in the code base and mutant chronicles is zero basically yeah. um, they have nothing in common so we're basically writing a like a decently substantial code base from scratch every time and it just doesn't make sense no, it doesn't. And, and I mean, what's the average, you know, what's an ideal uh, development cycle for you guys? Is it kind of four weeks, eight weeks to, to from conception to uh, deposited iTunes? Yeah. So everything ends up taking. So at some level, everything seems like it takes a month. Yeah. Uh, so no matter how simple it is, everyone's like, yeah, that takes three days. But even if the engineering took three days, like the artwork and design, you know, like designing the app takes longer than writing the app. Um, right now for our latest app, it's, it's well over a month because we're building on a lot of stuff for Facebook integration, yeah. uh, back end high scoreboard server side stuff. We're sort of building up a lot of the, um, the frameworks that we could use in other apps. Um, you sort of pay those costs down and then you have them to reuse. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, it's a little bit longer, but uh, if you have enough hooks in a third party, um, code libraries or sort of your own established code library, you can, you can definitely get um, something substantial done in a matter of weeks, months, two months, something like that. Yeah, they touch, you know, six or seven million people, which is pretty incredible if you're successful at it. So shift a little bit here to, to marketing, right? So, uh, you know, there's uh, I'm awareness, you know, we said at the very beginning where, where a lot of people just put up apps uh, into App Store, uh, they do it on the BlackBerry platform, App World. Uh, they do it with the you know the Android uh, um, uh, showcase as well, and and but they just put them up there, right? And and a lot of people just think that you know there's my marketing, there's my channel, there's there's my distribution. I just put it up there, and, and I'm going to sit back uh, and wonder why it doesn't succeed. Um, some get lucky, but more often than not. There, there's uh, there's there's no luck, even though the game is incredible or the application fits a fits a purpose. Um, what? How do you guys market this thing? Right? We we've talked, you know, bit back and forth about little uh, techniques like advertising for one game and another or one app and another. Um, you know, you guys are doing Facebook integration and uh, you know social media integration into the applications. But uh, how 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 do you guys do it? Yeah. So for us, there's kind of two components in terms of whether or not an app is going to be really successful and take off. Um, the first is getting noticed, like you said, you know, just getting that initial traction and just getting on the radar. Yeah. And then the other is kind of what happens when you actually hit the top 100 lists. Do you have the virality where you can grow and take it the rest of the way? Yeah. Um, at the end of the day, the, the App Store is a marketing channel and those top 100 lists are the most powerful tool you have. Um, that's how a lot of people are finding their apps, you know, almost exclusively often they're pulling up their phone and looking at the top 25 in the category or anything. So, you know, at the end of the day, to hit the, the really high success bar, you have to kind of thrive in that situation. And that, um, to us at least, is really up to the app and the quality of the app. And it's hard to predict, but some apps are going to have that, that viral bloom and other ones aren't. Um, but that's assuming that you can get on those 100 lists in the first place. You know, getting notice is where the marketing question really comes in. It is. Uh, it's it's kind of like the difference between uh, writing a song that you love, that is near and dear to you, or writing a song that the radio will love, right? Uh, and and you guys build an app in, in that kind of. Does that go into the decision about what you're going to do? It does in the sense that we won't make a song that we don't like. Yeah. Uh, you know there there well, is. Hold on. If you could have been a part of In Sync, I'm pretty sure you would have, right? Uh, <laughs> yeah. As a as a career launcher, right? You can have guaranteed success. It's one thing, yeah. but. You know, if you're going to write an app that has, you know, a very high probability of not going anywhere, uh, <laughs> it's important at least to us to know that, you know, it's not going to be the end of the world. We're not going to feel like, you know, we sold our soul for nothing or we wasted a month, you know, building some some piece of junk that even we don't want to use. Yeah. So as long as there's some kind of nugget of, of goodness in an app, um, then it's a worth worth at least taking a shot at. But when you so when Air Guitar was launched uh, last January uh, in '09, and, and you said you get like thirty five thousand downloads, and uh, you, you know you kind of thought you said to, earlier on that you were disappointed, right? Um, did you have expectations on that? And uh, and if you had been able to market that better, do you think that it, it could have come out of the of the gate a little faster? Yeah. So so I mean, first of all, so it's done thirty five thousand downloads to date. date. Okay. So yeah. So at the time. Um, and, it, and it's been out for yeah, well over a year and a half. Yeah. Um, and uh, we did do some marketing right away. So we did the Stanford iPhone um, apps.com 
uh, class uh, stuff. We actually, and then right away, um, we took a video on YouTube. Yep. Uh, and it's interesting, a lot of successful apps that we, people who wrote successful apps, they almost all seem to have YouTube videos. Yep. And it's unclear whether or not it's the people who can get successful apps also make YouTube videos or the YouTube videos that make them successful. I have a feeling it's the former for a large part that the people are working on multiple angles. Um, yeah, it's like no accident that they have YouTube and Twitter and yeah. Um, but we also one thing we did right away, which we've done for all of our apps, with great success. Is we just email all of the blogs. We just like write a press release, stick it on our blog, send some promo codes to Gizmodo and MacWorld and iPod Lounge, and then I think we've listed twenty or twenty-five. Mm -hmm. And our hit rate with that is actually pretty good. Um, I think every one of our apps has been covered by at least three. Um, and for Air Guitar, it was covered by quite a many, actually. It got translated, press release got translated into Portuguese, um, Spanish, I think, like Chinese. It also, it, it ended up on all these international re-syndications of, the, you know, the U.S. blogs. And I'm like, well, I didn't have to translate it. Like, that's great. Yeah, with Air Guitar, <laughs> the marketing side of the equation, as I said, was down. You know, we were in the, you know, the top 100 lists on the music category. Um, it definitely got noticed. A lot of the problems with the, the first version of Air Guitar um, was poor documentation. Um, yeah, okay. It's not necessarily the most intuitive app, and part of the reason why we were disappointed is because we would show this in person um, at conferences to other developers, to friends, and everyone was blown away. You know, they thought away, it was yeah. super cool. So you know, we had these big, high expectations, and then what we found is, you know, if you airdrop this into somebody's lap, um, a lot of people just didn't know what to do with it. Yeah. So a lot of what we've done in the past year is, you know, make more tutorial videos, make more clear text instructions. Yeah, um, we've seen the star rating on Air Guitar go yeah. up, so, you know, a full star when we put in a different exactly. tutorial video. Yeah, so that was it. Never got the traction, I think, because it never, never exploded the way it needed to, because just enough people weren't satisfied with it because they couldn't couldn't figure out how to get what they wanted from it. And, and uh, let's, um, when you guys release uh, now that you've you've had kind of eighteen months or almost two years, I guess, under your belt about releasing applications. Uh, you know, there's two camps, one that say just get it out there and then uh, improve on it, uh, you know, so get used to the abuse, right, the one stars, the angry people, um, you know, uh, we always say that it's a fault of the iTunes store that the only time you can rate it is, is when you delete it in anger, right? That, that is a huge problem. But, but uh, so... Um, do you, do you release quickly and then uh, improve the so and then you can you watch that grow? So yes, but um, not in the way that you phrased the question. Okay. Uh, I think it's not about releasing anything half done. It's about paring back your features as much as possible. Yeah. Um, yeah. So. So the experience is still good. Yeah. Uh, but it's it's limited for the first version, right? Yeah. Like take your core. So the first version of shotgun, no stats tracking, no achievements. No unlockables, no, no nothing like that. It's just a gun. People like that, and the people were asking us for the other things, so we built that out. Yeah, um, yeah so I definitely think that's, that's important is to pick out, it, because the iPhone, the screen isn't that big, right? An app shouldn't try to do that much. There's been this quote, you should do one thing and one thing well. Um, and when you try to be the be-all, end-all app, it just doesn't. Like, I'd rather have four apps that do four different things well than one app that does four things kind of well. Yeah. Um, it's just so easy to switch apps. It's just not necessary. Um, so I think you need to pick sort of like what the nugget is of what you need to get done. Get that done and then let your, because you have all these like, you can think of all the great things to do with it. But there's no reason to invest all that time if it's just not going to go anywhere anyway. So why spend four months having something that fails instead of one month having something that fails? And so, yeah. yeah. You'll get a good response. I mean, you'll get a good sense of what's going to work or what's not going to work. And and investing thirty days is a is a, is a good um, uh, experiment, right? And yeah, you see, yeah. you see if there's any traction with that, and then you build on top of it. Exactly. And you get good user feedback too. You know, you can let your users steer your roadmap to some extent. You know, you have the features in your head that you think are going to be the ones that everybody wants. And you know, sometimes the users are wrong, so you give them what you know they really want, not what they're asking for. But you know, Jobs does that all the time. Yeah, you can, um, you know, listen to what the users are saying. If they're requesting, you know, a feature that you plan for version three, maybe you bump it up a notch or whatever. Okay. And and what what about, um, so you, you use the blogs, you, uh, you use the social side, so you guys, uh, you know, push things out through traditional uh, media, which is, you know, press releases and, and those kind of things that, that generate interest. You put out promo codes. Uh, you leverage things on YouTube. I mean, I've seen the video, uh, I guess, of Eddie, you playing... Uh, uh, air guitar on YouTube. 
Yeah. Uh, do you, do people send you guys videos? Do you solicit that kind of stuff of them playing it or? Um, we've gotten videos of shotgun, some pretty hilarious ones. A baby playing the shotgun. Uh, uh, someone in the army was like running around his face. Um, <laughs> That's great. <laughs> yeah, like, um, but um, but not. Um, yeah, we haven't act actively solicited. One, one of our very early ideas for Air Guitar was actually like to run a contest and a giveaway, five hundred dollars. Um, but there's a lot of like legal. You, you see that very, very rarely in the iPhone um, because, yeah, we were sort of in over our heads with getting the, the legality and contracts and yeah. agreements um, squared away. Yeah. Um, so some people, some people run that more on their website. Um, so Tapulis did something that was like write in a handwritten letter to us about how you love Tap Tap Revenge 3 and then we'll send you... I forgot what it is they sent them. Sent them something. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And they got like, a flood of handwritten letters. That's pretty cool. Uh, yeah, but sort of keeping it outside of the application yeah. um, hey, has been fun. Well, what, what's worked the best for you guys when it comes to these things, to, to marketing? Is it is it the blog outreach? Um, um, for us, I mean, so IGN, like we said, is what got Shotgun Free yeah. unquestionably off the ground. So blogs definitely do make a difference. Yeah. Um, it can be somewhat hit or miss, which was always surprising to us. Sometimes we get, you know, what we think is the, the holy grail of blog posts, and then we see like a 10 download spike or something. Yeah. It's the, the percentage of people that are reading that blog that, you know, then have an iPhone that are interested in your app that take the time to do it, you know, it can trickle yeah. down a bit. So being able to advertise right on the phone tends to be a little more effective because you're kind of right at the checkout line already. Yeah. Um, you know, it's nice for us because we have a stable of apps, we can do that cross promotion yep. uh, and leverage our existing user base. But obviously someone starting out for fresh doesn't necessarily yeah. have that. And we have in the past um, decently extensively we've advertised on AdMob yeah. uh, for our own apps. And we also have bought a bunch of installs from TapJoy mm -hmm. um, before sort of just to drive ourselves off the top hundred list. Okay. Um, that was always it was never ROI positive on a download by download basis. It's, it's much more expensive to get a user than you get from a user. Um, yeah. But if you can spike up the list, so we were like, we were at 110. Um, this was after Shotgun had fallen off the top one of the list. So spike number two, and it trickled down, took mo many months actually. And, if, and it dipped down, and then we had an update that bumped it up from like 150 to 110. And so we spent a bunch of money in like 20 minutes. We just like dumped it into AdMob. We got to 100, and then that actually sent it back up again. That's, on pretty its own. Yeah. That's pretty amazing, the impact of that, isn't it? Yeah, it's like right at that boundary where like 110 is nobody and 100 is somebody. <laughs> and we're like, what's it going to take? Yeah, it's like getting a 90 on your wine review. You know, it's the, the yeah. difference between, you know, getting that purchase and not. Well, it's like uh, getting 51% is fine with me, right, uh, in school or whatever it was. But um, now what about, uh, so let's talk about very, very quickly. Let's talk about uh, the blog post that you did, Eddie, about uh, the app developers. So you just posted this recently about yeah. the, the top 100 app developers kind of dominating the number of reviews that, that are out there. And then the other 39,000 app developers who have released something like, you know, with barely any reviews at all. Um, so you guys fit in there. Where, where were you guys? You guys were... Fit? Number 68, I think. 68? Yeah. So what, what inspired this? Like, you know, this is this is definitely the economist in you coming out saying, okay, let's let's analyze what we're doing here, and, and uh, you know, nice pie chart that you or not pie chart, but uh, you know, yeah, little graph that we got here that, that showcases this very very un uh, un game like, right? Yes, yeah. I mean, we've always, um, yeah. So as I said in the beginning, so Netable Software is in some ways just like a catch all for things that we find interesting. Yep. So, like, shotguns and teaching are quite different. Um, and I like data. I always have liked data. Um, back, uh, so we use AppViz now uh, for our download numbers, but in the very start, before AppViz was around, I wrote a bunch of scripts in Stata to plot all of our download numbers. And we actually, we once received an offer from someone to buy, um, essentially, Shotgun Pro from us um, and to keep all of the revenues. And so I did some models and projections of our future revenues to realize that they underbid us by like a third wow. or something. And, and the number seemed fine at the time, but when it actually started to, to boil it down, I realized that if we held on to this thing for the next year, um, it, it, would do, it would do much better. And so this is sort of the same, same thing. I'm like, well, what is, so Apple's really stingy with their download numbers, um, but they have an API for getting information about apps. And then um, I actually, I just spoof myself as the iTunes client 
and sort of navigate the iTunes store. Nice. Uh, it's the equivalent of hitting like the next button um, for the next 20 apps uh, a thousand times in a row. Um, and, and so I did that and sort of, and then got into the pages and sort of scraped all the data out. Um, that was a fun project. So I learned a lot about stuff, XML parsing and whatever. And then I got the data together and it's sort of starting asking interesting questions. Um, so the, uh, the start of this actually, which is still um, on the way, is I wanted to color analyze all of the icons on the store to be like, what color icons do people like to download? <laughs> but um, that's like a big... So I, I, I now have on my hard drive 40 gigs of icons. Um, yeah, so, um, and I've started to color process them. But, um, but the first question was, uh, that was harder uh, to do, <laughs> so, like tackle something else first. And so I was like, we've always known that this is a winner take all market. Yep. Some people do really well. Your app is either going to be, there's, it's not like some, you know, son of bell curve. Like it's super exponential. It's like there's, Five percent of the people control nine percent of the downloads, yep. and like that's just how it's how it is. And so it's uh, one seventy, the top one seventy have as many downloads about as the bottom thirty nine thousand and five. That's incredible. Um, which is yeah, amazing. And I'm I'm kind of glad we're we're in that one seventy. Yeah. Uh, but we've seen this ourselves. You know, I've seen people who worked really hard in applications, put them out, um, and as James said before, don't necessarily market them that well. Maybe they weren't that good to begin with, or who knows, whatever the reason and they end up on the right side of that. Um, and it's try trying to get people to understand that like, there is a lot of opportunity here, um, but you know, it's, not, it's not like you can sort of do it halfway. Yeah. It's like you really need to go and try to push your application because you can't just coast solidly in that like, gray, in, in, you know, in center. There is, there is no center no. Um, like to coast in. But it's it's uh, somewhat disheartening when you think about it. Where where you uh, that top 170 application developers uh, owns the downloads. It owns all the reviews. It owns everything. But if you flip through, the top few are all big companies. Yeah. But there are plenty of indies in that list. Um, so and um, yeah, and this is also by the way, it's 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 roughly down. So for our own applications, our number of downloads and ratings correlate quite quite. Um, yeah, very highly. Yep. But um, this doesn't take into account anyone for any pay applications. Um, okay. Since free applications in general get a thousand times more downloads, yeah. all the guys who are big pay application guys are sort of being um, swept down. Way down. In this list. But for free applications, like if you don't do, it's all about, it's all about serving a lot of ad impressions. Yeah. If, you're, if you're not serving a lot of ad impressions, you're not making anything. There's no like, I've got a couple thousand downloads so I make. It's like, a buck a day yeah. or something, right? So you need to have like a million downloads or something. And that's the volume you need in order to be able to be profitable or, or start to generate good revenue when it comes to ad displays in, in a free app. Yeah. yeah. And, and the number of people who have actually cracked that, I mean, it's probably in the hundreds. Yeah. Um, but it's not, it's not like any old app does a million downloads. I think my town just crossed two million. Yeah. And it's Kleiner backed, you know, it's well developed. It's certainly well promoted. Like Apple has sponsored it in like four spots on the front page. Yeah, they barely just rolled past two. Yeah, and you're up over six, which is uh... yeah. Yeah, though I'll say that our users use the app a lot less than my town. Yes, well, and that's one of the things that people talk about, which is you know how many impressions are you going to get? Uh, you know how sticky is the application? How many times do people use it in a day or you know every every week? Um, and it's uh, yeah, I mean it's very rare that you're going to be able to make some good money unless you have that. Uh, viral impact that, that something like shotgun does have right so yeah you're right some of these some of these developers that i'm looking at here the top ones are obviously you know game loft and digital chocolate and you know facebook and ea uh yeah. what surprised me was that you guys are ahead of guys like skype right apple uh, apple <laughs> <laughs> right. we're ahead of apple yeah they're number like 80 or something yeah thq I've always right? said doing useful things doesn't get you anywhere <laughs> exactly exactly but you're right you're right ahead of adult swim like you guys got to be proud about that, right? Uh, and, yeah. Uh, like uh, I, I think about these things, and, and um, but ahead of Skype, ahead of Apple, um, Nickelodeon, Play First, like all of these guys are are, uh, and and you're right behind Disney, right? Like you're two behind Disney, so <laughs> we'll get so, them. Yeah. <laughs> We're coming after you, Jobs. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. On all fronts. Um, well, so I mean, I there, there's uh, there's quite a lot of information that's packed in here, and and I, and I kind of want to. I, I want to pull back a second and and, uh, and summarize this uh, by asking you guys 
Uh, you've been doing this for a couple of years. You've gone through the the program at Stanford. Um, what 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 kind of What's, what's the biggest lesson that you've learned um, over the last dur during this process? Um, and uh, and, you know, where does that what impact has that had on your thinking about the future of the business, maybe getting into a platform and moving away from the application layer itself? Yeah, I mean, I guess number one is kind of the obvious. Everything that can go wrong will go wrong. Um, so, you know, you know, making sure you're nimble enough to, to get around it, making sure that you know, you don't have any single weak points where, you know, one thing is going to come down and, and bring your whole company with it. Um, you know, making sure that you're kind of emotionally robust enough to handle a couple failures and, and make sure you have other options. You know, not putting all your eggs in one basket for, you know, just the reason we were saying, you know, we teach and we tried out contract work and we like doing our own apps, but, you know, we might not always be able to come out with our own apps. So thinking about how we could be selling to other developers instead of to consumers or to, you know, larger companies. Um, trying to think outside the box, you know, for a while it wasn't clear that free apps were going to be necessarily sustainable and paid apps, you know, are tough unless you're going to form a company around a single app. So then thinking about white labeling for other companies or doing promotions for companies where they just want the sheer number of downloads and they can pay for it instead of the consumer. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think there's just a lot of opportunity in the mobile space. It's evolving like really, really, really rapidly. Yeah. Um, but because of that, someone might come to you and say that, you know, they're they're rushing as fast as you're rushing. So um, a good, like the, the great example of this that we face every day is that the ad companies, the ad networks, are rushing out their ad libraries um, very rapidly, and 100% of them have had horrible problems. Yeah. Um, and so uh, and you just expect it at, the, at this point. Um, you know, so sick and ad mediation, it, it, it saved us nine times from from potentially losing all of our revenue and it had so basically hedging against something going wrong with one ad uh one ad network to be able to make sure that you have yeah. you have other ones i mean i've i've loaded uh, um you know uh, certainly ad supported games and uh we were just i was talking to a colleague last night about this is that he he uh loaded an ad supported game that it was d directed to children and you know there was a, a dating ad Right, that that popped yeah. up, right? Those kind of things. So, you know, the granularity of, of mobile ads are uh, are challenging. So, you want to be able to be nimble enough, as you said, to uh, to avoid those situations, right? Uh, yeah, I mean, we had the same. We we had an ad network that was putting in um, vaguely scam ads, like you took a quiz and then you ended up signing up for something that was like nine ninety nine in your phone bill. Yeah, and we had the flexibility to pull them from an application um, on the spot from the web. Yeah, uh, which was really nice. Yeah. yeah, and just the sheer instability of the code base. You know, lots of the libraries would crash when they got, you know, in some bad situation. And so, you know, for reference, Shotgun Pro, I don't think we've had a crash report, um, you know, in since our last update. I think we finally actually squashed all of the crashes. Everything. But Shotgun Free, you know, I'm going to be honest, it's, it's not as stable, and it's because of the, the third-party code that's in there, and there's only yeah. so much we can do to protect it. But sort of on the flip side, though, you know, we get a lot of services from that third-party code. So we don't have to do direct sales or advertising. We don't have to write our own analytics. Yeah. Um, we actually didn't end up using any third-party high scoreboards, but there's quite a few options for that, like Open, open Faint. Faint and, yeah. yeah, plus Benji Moco yeah. and, and soon Game Center yeah. um, from Apple. Yeah. Um, so, and that's really nice. Like, you know, I don't want to write all that stuff. You know, and there's uh, Twitter. There's the MG Twitter engine, yeah. um, which allows you basically to easily wrap it up. Um, we're writing our own for Facebook, um, but it's just, you know, some things you do yourself, but yeah. some things you can just get outside the box. And that allows you to basically get, like, your core competency shouldn't be everything. <laughs> that's a good, that's, that's yeah. the best advice, I think, right there. Like, yeah. You know, uh, and that's exactly what, what you see a lot of developers doing, piling this on, and, and, uh, and they turn a one-month project into nine or ten months. And yeah. all of a sudden, a lot is riding on on what happens. Uh, with, yeah, and the whole market has changed. Like you know, like it could be. Yeah, we had this day where it was. We came back uh, from lunch, and Apple had announced in-app purchase for free applications. Yeah. And we're like, clear the schedule. Like roadmap for our entire company is being rewritten right now. Yeah. Um, and so we sat down and we just like, what does this mean for us? And this happens very regularly. Yeah. Apple announces Game Center. Apple announces iAd. You know, Apple pulls all of like the boob and sex apps from the store. Yeah. 
um, that things, and whatever it is, like if you're, what you started nine months ago could be completely irrelevant. Yeah. yeah. Now. It's pretty, uh, it, it's such a fast moving, I mean, it's a land grab. Everybody's trying to figure it out. And, and the guys at the helm, the guys from Apple, the guys from Black, from RIM, um, the guys, uh, you know, Google it as well. They're, they're all trying to figure this all out, right? Uh, yeah. At the same time as, as they're trying to build up an ecosystem of developers that will support them. Uh, yeah, I mean, for Apple, they clearly never expected the app sort of take off like they did. They made multiple statements about that. Um, a lot of the back end reporting was all a little, little wonky. The app approval process, you know, as I said, three months for one of our applications, yeah, um, and it it killed it. So you know, it's like, oops. I, I launched an app uh, with one of my companies. Uh, the, you know, the very first go round when when uh, the App Store was launched in in Canada, and mm -hmm. uh, we pushed it out, and uh, we didn't expect it to be. Uh, um, accepted so quickly and, and it was accepted and turned on right away and uh i mean it, it was seven days or whatever but we didn't accept it but um we wanted to do an update before it went live right so we wanted to get it into the queue we got it up and we got it run we got it approved but we wanted to have control over the fact that we wanted we wanted to uh just throw in an update once it was approved but it went live and uh and it went live and we couldn't take it off because they hadn't invented the button that allowed you to delete it <laughs> yeah. So it worked on fifty percent of the devices, oh. right? And uh, and and we were getting thousands of downloads a week, and we were just getting our, our support team was just getting hammered by yeah. calls and angry people. It doesn't work. It doesn't work. And I was on the phone with the support guys in Ireland, and and they're saying, "Well, just hit the delete. You know, just delete it." And I'm like, "Guy, you haven't put it in the I no can't, button. Doesn't yeah. exist." Yeah, oh, I mean, yeah, you're right. It'll be three weeks. I'm like, no. No. Yeah, exactly. Like with that problem, when we did our promotion, we did something for Ubisoft. We tied in to Shotgun, and they were like, "We wanted to launch on this day." Yeah. And we were like, "We can't even get you remotely close to that. <laughs> like, we can submit it three weeks ahead of time, which is our average yeah. approval length, and you know, we can do our best." And Apple ended up going long. Um, I think it took like five weeks. And or maybe maybe it was like six. Anyway, they were free Ubisoft was freaking out because they were launching a game and this was like a big part of their marketing strategy. And I'm on the phone with Ireland, you know, being like, it's not inedible software, it's Ubisoft. Like, can I get anyone with any power to like email this email address? Yeah, exactly. I was like, wait, the top of the line is an email address? Yeah. That's that's oh. where they, that, that's expedited. That's like the, the most important thing. Don't talk to me, email somebody. Yeah. yeah. So true. No. Yeah, well, I can't go back to them and be like, I sent an email. Don't worry, it's under control. Yeah, it is. It's like an aggressive letter writing campaign. It's not going to do anything, right? Uh, <laughs> yeah. Well, listen, guys, I uh, I mean, I feel like a, a lot of uh, – I'm intrigued with what you guys are doing. Uh, you know, uh, certainly, as I said, a lot of people have been asking about uh, when I was going to get you guys on. Um, this could be a, a nine-part series, I believe. <laughs> uh so uh, I'm gonna I'm I'm gonna get you guys back on here a little bit later uh, in the year. Um, Want to kind of explore maybe what you're gonna do on the platform side and see how that evolves because uh, you guys are well ahead of a lot of the other companies that I've that I've spoken to just in the in the in the thinking right. What's what's next? Can we make a living doing this? We built some analytics. We built some tools that have helped us. That's a uh, that's a. Uh, is that the natural evolution? So I'm gonna follow up with you guys to see see how that goes uh, as, as you guys work this through. Uh, so, uh, you guys can be found at inedibilesoftware.com. Um, are you guys on Twitter? Uh, uh so I have mine. It's E L M A R K S is my personal one. Um, we'll be starting an inedible software Twitter probably for shotgun duel just to, ha to have it as part of that ecosystem. Yep. Um, but we, yeah, it, we wear a lot of hats and so social media, uh, no, but, not, yeah. we're not quite there yet. Okay. Yeah. But it's inedibilesoftware.com. Inedible inedible software. And if anyone wants to contact you, it's me directly, james at inedibilesoftware.com. Yeah. Um, I can be slow to respond, but I'll read it at least and, and get back to you as soon as yeah. I can. That's great. <laughs> yeah, there's the big caveat. Well, I've been speaking with uh, Eddie, right? And uh, James, uh, look, I really, really, really appreciate you guys coming on. Thank you guys so much. There's been a lot that uh, to digest in this. And hopefully you guys who are watching this and listening to this 
pull over, write down the question, throw up some comments on the on the uh, you know comments below, and uh, and let us know what you think. Um, and you guys know how to get in touch with uh, with Eddie and James ineditablesoftware.com and uh, it's a tough one guys I'll be honest I, with you. that's a huge mistake actually but um, <laughs> inedible you know. inedible got it by the end of it I'll get it um, guys thank you so much for uh, for coming on yeah, thank you thank Great you time. yeah and that is another session of Untether uh, in the bag thank you guys